Why are people hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer? Why? Why? It's like we've decided we're going to play a game called win the pandemic and beat our neighbors at a, what's become a, a, a very disturbing uh, game. Why? Why are we doing this? Actually, that question deserves an answer. It's not merely rhetorical. And today I want to address what it is that motivates people to take shelves that look like this, perfectly fine shelves, and turn them into shelves that look like this. Some people might say, we don't like each other. That's the reason why we're hoarding goods. We don't like each other so much, we are so uncivil, and we are so antagonistic toward our neighbors that we are willing to trample them on the way to clearing off shelves of toilet paper. In fact, a lot of people attribute the problems, many problems in society, including our response to the coronavirus, to incivility. Particularly in politics, name-calling, conspiracy theories, demonizing the opposition, you name it, we've got it. In an election year, which is already pretty nasty, and it's going to get worse. Today, I want to suggest that the problem in our society and politics is not incivility. Today, I'd like to make uh, uh, two points. First, the problem is disconnection. We are disconnected from each other, our neighbors, our communities, and government. And secondly, we can understand this problem a little bit better by analogizing it to the rules of a game. Now, why is, is disconnection the answer to the problem rather than incivility? It's because while uncivil people can be mean and rude, disconnected people behave selfishly. Think about it like this. It's Thanksgiving after your family has driven each other nuts, several arguments have broken out, and your significant other is no longer speaking to you, it's time for dessert. What prevents you from taking the large piece of pie on the right and leaving that small sliver for your family and your friends? It's the connection. You're a member of a group. What kind of a sociopath takes all of the pie for himself, leaving only the scraps for his family and his friends? The different ways in which we respond to pumpkin pie and toilet paper illustrate a much documented problem in American society and politics. It goes something like this. The problems that we experience are the result of an, an increase in incivility, nastiness, causticness, and aggression. But here's the problem with that explanation. American society has always been uncivil. In fact, when this guy, Alexis de Tocqueville, visited the United States in 1831, he found a people practicing a, what he called a vibrant democracy. Now, this is our idealized vision of what that vibrant democracy looks like. But that's not what de Tocqueville found. He found a people practicing a politics that was nasty, vitriolic, and malicious. It was so nasty that even George Washington was not insulated from abuse. By the way, you may remember from the play Hamilton that these are the words that got Charles Lee shot by John Lawrence in a duel. Politics then looked very much like politics now. Saying our politics is uncivil doesn't really explain what's different. 
So what is different? What has changed? In the 1800s, Americans got, when, when Americans got done abusing and maligning each other, they went to church together. They played baseball together. They ate dinner together without much thought to political differences. And their children married each other. People connected their interests with the interests of the whole, and those interests surmounted any political differences. De Tocqueville called this civic virtue. So what's different today? Unlike in 1831, Americans today feel disconnected from each other, from their communities, and from their government. We have, to put it in de Tocqueville's terms, much less civic virtue. The documented process looks like this. As affluence grows and people acquire much more money and resources, they become individualistic and self-involved. And self-involved people become disassociated. They become so disassociated because they cannot stand to be around people who think differently than they do. Generally, people have two responses to this kind of society. The first response is to uh, move into tribes of, assort, them, assort yourself into tribes of like-minded others who associate only with people who think like you do. The problem with that is we end up having a conversation with ourselves. We end up having very limited relationships that don't challenge, they don't expand the mind, the, uh, they, they don't create the potential for new ideas. The other response, uh, well, and, and also uh, it may result in, in fury directed at outgroups, at people who don't think like you do. The other response is a little different. Many people didn't sort themselves into tribes. They went home and they turned on Netflix. Study after study correlates increased wealth and affluence in Western democracies with a range of pathologies like social disconnectedness, loneliness, declining civic participation, and a lack of trust in government. Disconnectedness and social isolation correspond with decline in empathy for others, a rise in emotional dysregulation, decline in, uh, in uh, 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 attachment to government. It includes anxiety, narcissism, and a range of psychopathologies and neuroses. I want to offer a different way of thinking that might help us break out of the social isolation into, and the silos of similar opinion into which we have warehoused our brains. Let us think for a moment of, of society as a game. Think of your connection to society, to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and community, and government as a game. What are the rules of this game? There are two things to know. First of all, there are generally two types of games. Secondly, you may be thinking you're playing one game, but you're actually playing another. You can be wrong about what game you are playing. So what are these two types of games? Well, the first is called a collective game. A collective game is in one, in one in which you play as a group. You cannot win unless the group wins. An example of this is Dungeons and Dragons or World of Warcraft. Uh, the other type of game is called a zero-sum or one-winner game. This is a game in which you win and you can only win if everyone else loses. An example of this type of game is Monopoly. There are also in-between games. I, I, I will admit to that. There are in-between games. There are games where somebody is going to win, but nobody really cares who does. It's the group experience, the connection with others that matters the most. And an example of an in-between game would be Cards Against Humanity. So what game are you playing? The civic-minded people in society are playing Dungeons and Dragons. They are connected with others. They have connected their goals with the goals of a group. The disassociated tribe, they're playing Monopoly. 
They have to win, and every, they cannot win unless everyone else loses. The socially isolated have stopped playing altogether. Um, I'll freely admit that no game is perfect, and every single game uh, has, their, has its problem. Just because you're playing a collective game doesn't mean that you win. There are some games where, uh, collective games in particular, where to win, you can't just simply focus on the goal that the group must achieve. You have to convince members within the group not to exploit common resources and, uh, and take advantage of, of other members by acting badly or selfishly. Here's an example of that. Does anybody remember Leroy Jenkins? If you haven't heard of this, go look at it, at it on YouTube. A group of people playing World of Warcraft are attempting to go through a set of doors. They know on the other side of that, those doors, there are monsters. They are attempting to uh, coordinate their activities when one of their members decides to go rogue, yells his name out, and goes in through the doors and into the room. The rest of the group doesn't know what to do. They follow him in, and everyone dies. Everyone loses. Now, that was a setup, as we know now. It was, a, it was a setup, but it's a very good illustration of what happens when a member of a group behaves badly. Um, a society, uh, society is a collective game. By definition, if you are a member of a society, you are playing a collective game. But for some reason, we often mistake that game for a zero-sum game. For example, that moment when you realize you weren't playing a zero-sum game. This individual recounted on Facebook an instance in which he, an interviewer, was standing on a subway and a man brushed by him and then told him to go F himself. A little later, that man showed up for his interview with the man he had just cussed out on the, uh, on the uh, subway. It got a, a little tense when he asked him how his commute was. This individual thought he was playing a zero-sum game, but he was actually playing a collective game where he needed a job and the interviewer needed to hire someone and everyone lost because he mistook which game he was playing. Now, the problem with zero-sum games is this. It's hard to identify the bad actor. It's hard to identify the bad actor. For example, these three people represent a society, but it's one in which a powerful actor who controls most of the resources, has convinced the other two members that they need to play a zero-sum game for control of the scarce resources that remain to them. The same situation exists here. These two individuals are traveling on an airline. A woman documented this uh, on Instagram. She leaned her seat back into the private space of the individual sitting behind her, and the man sitting behind her proceeded to punch the back of her chair throughout the rest of her flight. Now, who is the bad actor here? Who's the bad actor? Is it the man punching the seat? Or is it the woman who has leaned her chair back into the personal space of an individual and, uh, so that she can travel com comfortably? It's neither. It's the airline. But unfortunately, these two individuals are so interested in and pointing the finger at each other and assigning blame that they've missed who the bad actor is. On the other hand, think about this. The NBA season is canceled. March Madness is canceled. Ted has been moved to July, and I am speaking to a room full of empty chairs. These were decisions made by people who had millions of dollars to lose, and they decided that they were playing a collective game. If they had played the zero-sum game and held the NBA uh, uh, season and held March Madness, there would have been a, a severe price to pay for the collective. They would have made their million, but the collective would have lost. So they are the good actors. They made those decisions as good actors for the benefit of the collective. So what is the upshot of all this? Well, first of all, society stands a better chance of surviving if all of the members of that society believe that they are playing a collective game. They can focus on achieving the goals of the group while controlling the behavior of the members and identifying who is the bad actor. On the other hand, the society where individuals think they're playing a zero-sum game is less likely to survive 
because the individuals are so interested in competing with each other that they miss who the bad actor is who is exploiting them. So stop worrying about incivility and start worrying about connection. Stop, start playing the collective game and stop playing the zero-sum game. If you play the collective game and we all play it together, we can say with a great deal of credibility to the bad actors, you may be exploiting your position for your personal gain, but we are coming for you. Thank you for your time.